relation to transformation um, and that truly transcendental art shows you something that you are not yet but you can become um, and I think that's one of the important points about art because we have this entire spectrum of consciousness and the artist himself or herself can be coming from any one of those levels and therefore attempt to express reality that are themselves pre-personal or personal or transpersonal. And what happens with art, if you take visual art, painting as an example, is it's an artifact. And as such, it doesn't itself possess consciousness. So a painting of my mother isn't conscious like my mother is. And so the agency, the form, the pattern, of the artifact is imprinted on it by the artifact's creator. So whatever state of consciousness or structure of consciousness the artist has will govern the pattern of the artifact. And then when individuals come and look at the artifact, they'll resonate with the same state or structure, if they have it available to them, that the artist portray, and particularly the better the artist is at conveying, expressing these states, then the more likely the larger number of viewers will see the artifact and and have an evocation of the same state that the artist was in. And so that's why we can we can trace art over you know historical epics and see the dramatic changes in perspectives and and, and what shows up and what's allowed, um, all determined by the structures of consciousness that, that the artists had at the time. And um, so that's all the way back to um, Paleolithic cave paintings um, where images are drawn over each other and, and there's no third person perspective or anything like that. And you think of the images on the side of the Egyptian pyramids. They're all two-dimensional. There's no understanding of third-dimensional depth. And that starts to arise with orange formal operational perspective. Because it can take the role of third person. So it can actually enact a world with depth perception of the third dimensional depth to it. And starting from Renaissance going through the Enlightenment, we see an explosion of that kind of painting. We see it in Michelangelo or Raphael. We see it in all the portraiture that was started at that time. It was just unheard of previously because it really couldn't be seen. It really didn't exist in the cultural background. And now there's also types of paintings that pushed into transpersonal states. And um, these are often forms that are used for contemplation. And the idea is that you identify a picture of a Tibetan god or goddess, and you concentrate on that, you visualize that. And it helps to actually bring forth what that image represents. If it's Avalokiteshvara, it helps bring forth compassion. If it's Manjushri, it helps bring forth wisdom, and so on. But we in the West, we, we got our spiritual intelligence going from our cave to magic to mythic. And there, it's, it, it got jammed. And so as the Enlightenment arose, science tended to step to the foreground. 
And religion didn't follow suit. Religion didn't continue its own growth into uh, world-centric modes of uh, understanding. And so many of the world's religions are stuck at that fundamentalist, ethnocentric, if you don't believe in my path, you can't get salvation. They haven't moved in their general understanding into a world-centric space. Which at this point is essential for a uh, uh, a new perspective on, oh, yeah. on religion. Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, because uh, uh, it's unavoidable. And the uh, avoidance of it right. leads to all kinds of skirmishes. Right. Sure. Well, you take the psychograph, uh, and I did this, I, I looked over the past um, 50 or so terrorist acts over the last 20 years. And all of them have the same form. The person is at an amber level of development. They're in mythic membership, fundamentalist, conformist um, stage of development. Absolutistic thinking, as Claire Graves called it, and they have a red underbelly. They have they have just a real power uh, drive, and they'll often talk in the language of postmodernism because they can use that to verify what they're doing. Oh, you can't say that what I'm doing is not true. The truth is something that's individually decided. This is truth for me, you have your truth, and so on. But what they're also saying is that the modern world makes no room for my religion. And therefore I have the right to blow it up. And whether it's Southern Baptists at abortion clinics, or Buddhists putting sarin gas in the Tokyo subway system, or Sikh separatists, or Al-Qaeda, they've all got this ethnocentric amber religion. And they believe it absolutely. They cannot take a world-centric stance. And so, <clears throat> under those circumstances, religion stuck at that fundamentalist level and stuck with an ethnocentric sense of morality, which is everybody inside my group is going to be saved. Everybody outside is infidel. They have no soul, and I have a right to kill them. In some cases, it's my job to kill them. Killing them is like a job promotion in, in, in God's eyes. I'm doing good. And it got stuck there. And all the other traditions kept moving up and moving up and moving up. Religion's the only major discipline in human awareness that stayed stuck at, at the mythic level. And so one of the things that we have to do is to, get, is to loosen up religion so it can pursue spiritual intelligence line into its own higher levels, through second tier and into third tier. And then third tier starts to also portray transcendental states, actual experiential states of spirituality. But we are stuck. And so, and, which is a, a, a shame, because the role of the artist, one of the roles of the artist, would be using spiritual intelligence, and then combined with an aesthetic, technical capacity, to evoke in their paintings these higher truths. There are deeper, higher, wider realities then you, modernity, or you, post-modernity, are aware of it. And by contemplating art that has come from a higher level of development, some degree of that is imprinted in that art. It has some capacity for transmission, some capacity for a regular viewer looking at that art to be taken beyond themselves into a transcendental, transpersonal reality. And I think this can be on the left hand or the right hand quadrants. Uh, left hand 
is harder to do visually because you can't see interiors well at all. So you, you can't see mutual understanding. So how do you paint that? You, you, know, you can't see love and devotion and care. How do you paint that? Um, but it can be on the right hand also where we have a spectrum of energies. And this is one of the things that you often tap into. I mean, they're gross, they're subtle, they're causal energies. And these are actual energy flows. And those can be seen as objective if you have the right training, if you know how to open your eyes. And a lot, not all, but a lot of your painting is depicting the actual concrete lines of energy and streams of energy that come from these higher states and, and stages. Well, it's part of that, uh, as you were noting in uh, some previous essays and things, that there's a kind of a tradition of, I call it transfiguration, because yeah. of its association with the Christian uh, story of, of uh, Christ exhibiting his light body, basically. Uh, and, but there are all the various uh, sacred art traditions have, uh, if they're iconic, uh, it's often in relationship with the light body and uh, the halos, auras, and misses, and uh, even in the petroglyphs and uh, uh, spread throughout the world, we see uh, kind of uh, radiating uh, heads, halos, uh, we see uh, the energy flows yeah. around the body and things like that. So they're kind of universal archetypal. Yeah. Uh, perhaps clairvoyant uh, kinds of perceptions of the uh, energy body, by the subtle energy bodies. And the, uh, uh, I, I think that there's a, a fairly comprehensive map, even though it's not really uh, tied together yet, uh, of, and I know that you've been working on that as well, with the subtle uh, bodies and things, tying them together from the different traditions. It's always been uh, a multi uh, perspectival kind of uh, uh, map of, right. uh, of those dimensions, uh, which are, I think, important just because they're a they're emblematic of of uh, the, the kind of uh, holistic vision of bringing it together from science, uh, Western science. That's why, in my work, I try to bring in a. a at least scientific perspective on things. There's galaxies, there's bones, there's uh, things that... Circulatory system. system. Things that yeah. we know from our science texts and things. Uh, so, so my thought was that perhaps at this point, through science uh, and uh, art, and of course my perspective has always been a little psychedelic, so <laughs> with, with the uh, uh, recent uh, breakthroughs like at uh, Johns Hopkins and yeah. their whole psilocybin studies yeah. and things like that, that uh, um, if it's possible that you could pretty much replicate 65% uh, uh, of spiritually inclined uh, people who uh, take psilocybin are able to have a mystical experience within that safe set and setting. Uh, that that sixty-five percent delivery of a of a mystical experience is a is a pretty good number. Yeah it is. Uh, and uh, that would seem like a better religion because religion is about uniting self and God, I, essentially, to link back to that I mean that the primary purpose of religion, uh, and uh, and Bob Jesse is always the center uh, council on spiritual practices. He's always been uh, one for aiming at. Uh, let's not give the fundamentalists that word religion. It's too important a word. Uh, we can talk about the primary religious experience, and that's essentially the same as the mystical experience. The secondary religious <coughs> experiences of what we're washing, but uh, uh, 
uh, to reclaim the word is important or not to be too scared of it. Yeah. Uh, because, frankly, I have been, and a lot of my friends are as well. They don't want anything to do with religion. Yeah. When we talk about God or we talk about religion in relation to art, and we started a church. I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> we are going whole hog. It's, it's like partly conceptual art piece because I think art needs to go there. Sure. You know. To, well, to, we started a church because but, we do what churches do. And so we felt that we should get the advantages and the responsibilities that churches in this country have. I mean, if you're performing weddings and baby blessings and having regular services and ceremonies, there's, you know, you know you're doing what churches do. And so yeah. why should you not take those, uh, those advantages? But um, I also had a question about, uh, you know, the, the, the amber people that are blowing stuff up and causing these, um, these, these terrible things to go on. I mean, don't you feel that they think that they have had a personal uh, contact with the divine? I mean, do you think that they, you know, they is, there, they is, there a, is there a, I mean, don't you think they would say, yes, I, I experience God, I speak to God? Oh, absolutely. I think they do too. And the point about that is, you, you can look at the state experience they're having, the Pentecostals, for example, have religious experiences all the time. It's part of their their actual uh, church attendance. And what they're experiencing is, is, is the subtle level realm of reality. And it's being interpreted through the amber structure. So they have this experience of a, of a subtle deity form. It's very powerful. It's very moving. Um, but then, when they talk about it, they can only use the tools that they have. And if their cognitive development is, is up to amber, and that's it, then that's the tool they'll use to interpret it. And so, I've had this experience. It was of Jesus Christ. I have been personally saved by Jesus Christ. If you have not been personally saved, I, I'm, I'm really sorry, but you're going to burn in hell. Is if you don't accept Jesus as your personal Savior, you cannot get saved. And that is a classic, absolutistic, amber, mythic membership. And so you're buying in <clears throat> to the particular mythic structure that they have supporting their experience. And in, 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 in the West, it's basically the Bible as the Word of God, literally. Everything in it is literally true. And we believe everything in it. It's literally true. Most of the people who say that haven't read some of the ridiculous things that the Bible will tell you to do. Why not do this? Of course, Absolutely, of course. You know, how but, do you but then there are those of us who have had personal experience of the divine, personal contact with the divine, and become more unitive. Become, yes. you know, like everything, it has a, you know, a, a a thread of sameness to it, like what the Dalai Lama That's said about uh, I don't know, be kindness a, being the yeah, be a good or, human being, yeah. not a bad human being. Well, this is a thread that goes through all religions, really. I mean, you know, because there are some zealots within each one. I don't. I think that we would all, uh, our unitive mind, will say that yes, they all have a commonality. So here we have, you know, people who have experience with the divine who are absolutists. And then there's the people who are unit. I think I think that the same distinction. No, the, no, not the same. I don't think so. The distinction, uh, like what you were saying, uh, that everything in the book is the truth. That is their delivered truth. Now, uh, and and it's mostly the interpretation of those uh, truths uh, that they most firmly believe in from a mythic membership uh, uh, kind of. You don't think that there's a little bit of a difference between uh, uh, melting down your boundaries and and uh, uniting with with all beings and things in a in a love energy oh. and and you can't be and, that and, and, and just and be reading absolutist that, that, too. You can't no, be both. It's, that, well, that's that's the odd thing. You can have this experience of being touched by Christ and being one with Christ and everybody that Christ touches. But when you come out and start interpreting that, 
if there are people that, like Muslims, do not believe in Christ, then you don't extend your kindness to them. It just doesn't work. You don't have the cognitive tools to put yourself in that role of other. So everybody who's a chosen people, I feel deeply connected with all of them. I have problems with people that don't believe the Bible and that don't believe Jesus. And that's one of the problems about religion is there, it goes, it runs the whole spectrum. Magic to mythic to rational, pluralistic to integral and transpersonal. And that same subtle level experience, let's say it just it comes down and it's luminous uh, volumes of love and bliss. Now how are you going to interpret that? Are you going to interpret that magically or mythically or rationally or pluralistically or integrally? And that's the problem. We, and our culture only has one accepted way of interpreting those experiences. And that is as a, you know, a fundamentalist. That most liberal media think that if you're a religious person, that you're that kind. That you're fundamental. That you're absolutistic in your thinking. And certainly, a lot of people are at that stage. And, and that's, that's how they interpret it. That's how they unpack their experience, which is a very authentic experience, by the way. That's a very real subtle realm, a very real deity form in that realm. And that's why the person who's had a reborn experience won't let you talk them out of it. Because they've had this experience, and it's real. I got it. I mean, I, I've had the experience, too, and it's very real for me, and I can describe it and have and Nobody could take it away from me. You could say, well, that was just hallucination. That was just, you know, your mind, blah, blah, blah. But you have, know, you, you have second tier uh, intellectual capacity. So you interpret it as <clears throat> unitive with all humans and possibly all sentient beings. And that's what we even see in James Fowler's research, where he traces the stages of, of religious development. And it does indeed go from uh, an archaic state to a magical state to a mythical state to a rational world-centric state, then into a pluralistic state, and then into a unity. And so the problem is, most people in this culture and all of the press just take the mythic version of religion. That's what is religion to them. So we look at the, all the editorial culture wars going on with Christopher uh, Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, all that. When they make fun of religion, what is it that they make fun of? Have you ever heard any of them put down, let's say, Zen meditation? No. They put down the belief that Moses parted the Red Sea and God rained down frogs on the Egyptians and all of that shit, all that Santa Claus stuff that comes with that mythic ever. And that's all they see in religion. Whereas religion is actually, in terms of spiritual intelligence, it answers the question, what is of ultimate concern for me? And that will change as you grow and evolve. And we're in the irony right now that religion, because it does span this whole spectrum, it goes from pre-rational to rational to trans-rational. It is both in its pre-rational, mythic, ethnocentric form, probably the largest cause of human-made suffering on the planet. At war after war after war, and expansion positions and just on and on and on. And yet in its transrational form, it's probably the single greatest source of human liberation. Totally. And both of these are looked at as the same. It drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that the Catholic Church has probably done a great deal more good than evil, or maybe the same, since there is yin and yang. But I mean, everyone you know complains about it and says you know how horrible and the power of it and all. But the good that's been done in the name of, of 
of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. the, the nice nuns and the, the good people. Right. You, know, you can't blame all of religion on yeah. some bad people. Yeah. Well, so now it's crucial that there's world-centric religion. Absolutely. If we're not... If we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if, or if we're not here to say. stay, you know, I see the, that that was my, uh, uh, I guess, interest in the uh, contemporary spirituality was that it was somehow it had found its way outside of religion or or by not I getting stuck with that tar baby of religion, I mean, at least it could like go in and look and see if there was anything worth uh, saving. Right. You know, and uh, so the answer is, yeah, plenty. Yeah. And I think what we're finding is that, that, that whatever you can call it, we call it religion, but if we think that that's what's happening. We just have two sold out evenings, 2,000 people, Closed down at 2,000. There were still people trying to get in, and this is the this is just the, the Denver, Colorado area. You know, it's like people are looking for something. They feel that they. It's almost like close encounters of the third kind. Yeah. They have to be there. They 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 they've experienced something, and they want to be around other people who've experienced it. And they're not getting it at church at the normal oh, exactly. churches and things like that. And they're not getting it at school. Right. And so where do they go? My God, let's go to the club. Right. And 